and the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ be overflowing within us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hey, as you're having a seat, give a fist bump to the folks around you. Say a quick hello. If you are a kid, 12 years old or younger, you're invited to join our team for Crosswalk. Nursery is also available. Man, I'm excited about our nursery program and our Crosswalk program. Hello, those of you guys watching us online. Glad you could join us there as well. All right, so we have a problem here at this church, and that is, you guys are so friendly. It's not really a problem, but when I say give a fist bump, you want to like talk and love on people, which is the right thing to do. I'm, ha I'm teasing you, but welcome once again this morning. My name is Eric. I'm the pastor here. Super excited, man. We're off to a strong start today, amen? Thank you, worship team, for leading us to the throne, leaving the door open for us to join you. So good, so good. Um, if I feel a little bit extra energetic today, I just want to confess to you that I left church last Sunday and went on vacation and um, been on vacation up till last night. So I am rejuvenated and I'm excited to be sharing with you this morning. Uh, hey, we're going to continue our series. This is the second to last um, episode uh, or uh, sermon uh, time together on our series on activating the church. So this uh, particular title is going to be uh, Sharing the Gospel, Part 2, Learning Together. What does it mean to learn together? And I'll unpack that a little bit. But um, I'm going to use an analogy. Uh, it came to me Friday night. I don't know what you guys were doing on Friday night, but I was sitting on the couch with my brother-in-law and father-in-law, something that we have done for, geez, 20 years now. We watched Philadelphia Eagles football, okay? Anybody else excited like we are about Eagles football coming this year? Okay, all right. We got a couple of boops or whatever in there. So good. Um, if you're not an Eagles fan, we are commanded to love you um, and forgive you, um, but we're not commanded to like you. I'm just, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Um, it's football, and I fully realize whenever you talk about football on a Sunday morning, some people are like, yeah, and now they're distracted thinking about football-like things, um, and there's another part of the crowd that's like, seriously, how long till he's done with the football analogy? And I get that. I lived that. Um, I didn't grow up liking football all that much. Whoever the local team was winning in the playoffs, I'd probably watch, but it was what I talked about. It was sitting down with other people that were into it. It was much less about what was on the screen and much more about us doing something together. So when my wife would watch us watch football and she was kind of like, what is happening there? Uh, Lauren was 0% interested. But I think whether it's because she wanted to enter my world and love me well or because she's like, if I'm going to give up four hours every Sunday to my husband, at least I should try to figure out what's going on. She, sa she started to say, hey, you know what, can you tell me a little bit more about the intricacies of the game? Now, most of us understand it's about taking this pigskin sphere and bringing it across an end zone, and that's how you win the game, if you do that more than they do. Uh, but there's a whole lot of intricacies to the game, and that's what she was asking me about. And this was a couple years back we started watching. This is post Donovan McNabb and pre-Nick uh, Foles, Carson Wentz. So this is kind of like the dark ages of the last, you know, 15 years of Eagle football. But there was a guy by the name of Jeremy Macklin, who was a wide receiver. He was kind of an underappreciated wide receiver, in my opinion, but that became Lauren's favorite player. She would watch for Jeremy Macklin or the running back and see what the running backs were doing. She knew to kind of hone in on them. And as we started with the wide receiver, we kind of expanded out more and more and more and more. And as she understood more of the intricacies of football, she started to enjoy it a whole lot more. And then she starts sitting on the couch. And I don't know, I don't want to say, because that wouldn't be true, that she was as excited as the rest of us were. But or at least not as outwardly excited. If you know Lauren, she's not a very outwardly excited person. Um, but I think inside she was really pumped up because she understood what was going on. Amen. Right? And that applies not just to football, but to anything. If you don't, if you, you might really enjoy sailboating. Um, and somebody else was like, sailboating is so dumb. But when you learn more about it and you see more about it, you're like, this is actually quite fascinating. Tell me more. Football is appreciated more when you understand it, number one. 
And it's appreciated, number two, when you share it with other people. I have watched games by myself, and then when they lose, and at least one-third of the time they do lose, that's an average football team, I'm just angry by myself. I like to be angry with other people. So, like, the thing coming together is really cool to share this experience together. Where in the world am I going with this? Well, I'm making a comparison from football to Christianity. Because I think for a lot of people, they have an understanding of what they think Christianity is, and they're like, that's dumb. But I don't know if they really understand it. And I think we're seeing more and more in these last three years even, more and more people who are trying to go about it on their own. I've got a personal relationship with God, so I don't need the church. The church is dumb. But we miss out. I'm going to just kind of play with words here a little bit. The difference between Christianity and following Jesus. When you're following Jesus, it's anything but dumb. It's exciting. It's thrilling. It's what you want to talk about. I'm so grateful that I've got friends who are following Jesus. And yes, we could take, talk about football and the weather and whatever else. But when we start talking about Jesus and discipleship, it's hard to shut us up. We're just so excited about it. And, and here's my point to us today, guys. If we can learn together what following Jesus is all about, oh, that's where the life is. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and life to the full. Not just add stuff on to what everybody else is going on, good morals or whatever else. So today we're talking about this, learning together. We're talking about sharing the gospel together. And what I mean by sharing the gospel together, I'm talking about in action as well as in word. The early church, this should be a pretty good example for us, Acts chapter 2 Peter preaches this message, 3,000 people get saved, pretty good day in the kingdom of heaven, right? Um, here's how the early church, there's the next thing that is described by, by Luke, who tells us about uh, Acts 2. He says, the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers. This means this wasn't just a Sunday morning meeting that they would attend and go home and I'll see you next week, check. They were devoted to the teaching and to the fellowship. When Matt, uh, Matt was praying about that, we would love each other well on Sunday mornings, but also throughout the week. Maybe that was Lauren too. Um, that's what it's all about. This wasn't a Sunday morning meeting you attend. This was a lifestyle. And they were devoted to this teaching. They were devoted to one another. To the breaking of bread, which I think meant communion, but also meant sharing meals together. And the prayers. We need to be devoted to the word of God. And the fellowship together. God's word, one of our key things is God's word is foundational. Knowing it and obeying it is essential to a life of meaning. We do this all the time at small groups. If you're part of one of our small groups here, you're reading the Bible together. Which is good. Which is great. Especially in a crazy time when there's all kinds of narratives that are out there and news and fake news and false truths and what's true for you might not be true for me and this postmodern thing we need to know what is true and so we study the bible together but i think we've since i've been here i've given you precious little time on a sunday morning when we're all together as family to look into the how how do we study the bible together so that's what we want to do today our, our big idea is we need to know how to study the scriptures together and what i want to do is not just teach you how and give you some principles but as we're talking about in this series, we're going to practice that together. And as we practice that together, we're going to see some really deep truths about Jesus and following Jesus came, come to light. So, talking about this fountain, and I'll use this little thing here as kind of an analogy of what it means to follow Jesus. And that top thing is following God, and that overflows into the way that we love each other. And that ought to naturally overflow into the way that we live on mission at our jobs, to our neighbors, those kinds of things. It should be a natural overflow of the same stuff. But James says, in James 1.22, he says this, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I love James. He's so right to the point. He's saying a lot of us can come to a meeting on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night small group, and we read it, and we hear it, and we say, Great. That was cool. See you guys next week. Right? We would not say that out loud. I mean, we would say see you next week. But 
we kind of live this truncated life sometimes. And what I'm saying to you is maybe we need to practice it together. <laughs> it starts when the whole family is together and it overlaps into normal everyday life. So in this series, we've been practicing things like sharing, listening to each other, not just hearing. I grew up in the house. A lot of times we were hearing each other, but we weren't really listening, right? I don't know if you've had that experience. We've practiced praying together on a Sunday morning, looking somebody in the eye and praying for them. We've spent time identifying what is our mission fields, and we've shared the gospel verbally with each other. Man, I had this great experience with Phil. Where's Phil? There you are, Phil. He was up here last week, and I looked him in the eye, and I shared with him 1 Corinthians 15, and he shared with me John 3, 16, and then we took communion together. That was so meaningful to look somebody in the eye and share the gospel with them as we remember Jesus together. This is about practicing this stuff together, not just hearing it, but doing it. May we be doers of the word. So today, once again, I want to share with you some principles on how we study scripture. Then we're going to study scripture, and then we're going to talk about it. That's where we're headed. Let's pray. Father, we continue to pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you would want to say to us today by your spirit. May we be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. May we be people who understand more and more, more and more, the life of following Jesus. How it's not boring or dumb. It is, man, the more we learn, the more there's more to learn. And may we do it together. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was 18, I went to college, and uh, I grew up in the church, so I prayed to accept Christ when I was eight, and for the next 10 years of my life, I was a Christian. Religiously, I was a Christian. But when I went to college, I kind of figured, hey, I got this thing down, and I'll see you, Lord, in four years. <laughs> you can imagine how that worked out. <laughs> Within the first couple of weeks, God kind of grabbed me by the scruff of the neck, and I'll tell you more of that story at a different time, but he got me plugged in with other people. And the idea of actually sitting down with other people, reading the word together and studying the word together was so life-changing. And then I graduated college. And like most 22-year-olds, not you guys, of course, other 22-year-olds, I knew that I had life figured out. So I started a job at a big church, and I would sit down with the leaders of that big church, and I would tell them how to do their jobs because I figured out at 22 what the Bible was all about, what Christianity was all about. But then I started to learn. And then I went to seminary and I started to learn more. And here's what I learned about the Bible. Here's what I learned about Christianity. The more you learn, the more you learn you have to learn. <laughs> the closer you are to God, the more you realize, I've got a long way to become more like God and to know him more. It's a beautiful thing. It's not a stressful thing. It's like, wow, I didn't even think about this. So here's what we're going to practice together. Number one, let me just share with you some three principles of studying scripture together. And we see this in our soap that we do here on, on Sunday mornings and throughout the week. There's three main principles about studying this book together. Number one, observation. What does it say? You come to a passage, what's going on there? What, what does it say? Number two, interpretation. What does it mean? Application, how does it apply? A lot of times we stop with the observation or we stop with the interpretation or we never get to that application. But listen, a lot of times we'll often jump ahead to the application without really knowing how to study the word. And so you go to a Bible study, and somebody will pull a verse out of context. And we see this with YouTube preachers all the time. They'll put verses out of context, and they'll get it to say whatever they want it to say. That's called eisegesis. That's called reading into something. What we want to do is read out of this, have this book read us. So we need to know how do we do this well so we're not coming up with random, wacky applications. Have you had ever, ever had that experience when somebody said, hey, I'm following God, I think we're going to do this. And you're like, that does not gel with scripture at all. Anybody have that experience? I feel like God is leading me to leave my wife. I'm calling God, I think God is calling me to cheat on my taxes. You're like, I don't know what God you're following. <laughs> but that's not what he talked about in here. We need to know how do we read this thing so we know how to live this for ourselves and for other people. So let's unpack this a little bit more. Observation. What does it say? Well, well, give me some ideas. Let's, let's make this a little more interactive. Uh, what are some things that we're looking for when we come to a passage and we want to just observe? What does it say? The context. the context. Huge. Context is king. Context. Yeah. What is context? The intended audience. Yeah, we're talking about the setting. We're talking about the when, the where, the who. That's good. 
What else? I'm sorry? One more time. Type. Type. What kind of genre it is? Yeah, absolutely. Because you can read something in Ecclesiastes, which is a poem, where somebody's moaning and saying, everything is meaningless. And if you don't know that's a different type than Jesus teaching on the cross, right? You're like, whoa, I just I heard a guy quote, everything is meaningless, so why don't I just go in X, Y, and Z? You got to know the different types of the different genre. Anything else? We kind of covered a lot of it. Let me show you some of the things I came up with here. Culture. Yeah, going back to context, what's going on in that time, in that place, for sure. Hit that next slide if you would, Brian. The when and the where. The who. Who is the author? Now, who's the author of Scripture? The Holy Spirit. Capital A, there's a capital A author. But here's the cool thing we learned about this a couple weeks ago. He used everyday people like you and me, and he actually used their voices to communicate truth about himself. So all scripture for 2 Timothy 3.16 is God-breathed, but he used different authors to communicate to an original audience. So what Matthew might be writing to Jewish followers of Jesus is going to come across different than John writing to a much more broad environment. And so you kind of see these things. The why. Can you tell why this passage is written? And sometimes it's easy because it's a letter and it'll say, I write this because... Other times, it's a little bit more inferred. I'll give you some tools on that. And then genre, this is what John was talking about. We got narrative, right, stories. We got teaching. And just because we say a story doesn't mean it's not true. We're saying this is what happened, and we might call it history. A teaching, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Poetry, prophecy, and letters, also known as what? Epistles, yeah. So, again... These are things we got to consider when we make our observations. If you're saying, hey, I'll be a small group leader, I'll, uh, I'll teach at Life Group, or I'll teach the kids at Crosswalk, these are important questions to ask so you know, am I making good observations? Secondly, let's talk about interpretation. What does it mean? Let me give you three principles for what does it mean. All right? This is really key. If you don't know what it means, you can make a lot of bad judgments and steer a lot of other people the wrong way. By the way, when I was a youth pastor, God dealt with me uh, one, one morning really strongly. And uh, I came to this conviction that probably the worst thing that I could do to somebody is to teach them wrongly about God. The worst thing I could do to somebody is to teach them wrongly about God. To, help, to, to lead somebody to think that they're right with God or saved when they're not. I take that very seriously. And so, even now, if you're hearing something from the pulpit or from an email or something that doesn't seem to drive with Scripture, I would want you to ask questions. Be a Berean, somebody who's checking the Scriptures and saying, Eric, you said this, but I see this. And we'll have a Bible conversation. And you might be right. Or I might be able to show you how I was right, and we'll have a good conversation either way. But there's three main principles here. The first is time-bound. And this goes back to what you were saying uh, before, uh, Dan, or the context thing over here. What did it mean to the original audience? All right, so you can come to some of these passages of Scripture where it gives a long list of what kind of hooves you should eat and not eat, and what kind of blood and how to cook a goat in milk and blah, 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 blah. You're like, this means nothing to me. I hate goat's milk, right? <laughs> but all Scripture is God-breathed. So what did it mean to that original audience? We need to kind of figure that out. That's a time-bound. It's bound to that context of when it was originally written. But it doesn't stop there. What do you think the next one is? Time lists. So no matter what the context or culture is, it's salvation by grace through faith. No matter what the context is, we're called to love God and love people. What does loving people look like? Well, we can unpack that a little bit more. But we need to understand the principles of Scripture apply no matter what the culture is. This is relevant because you'll hear a lot of people today say, well, when that was written, that was a different culture then. Times have changed, right? Maybe some folks here would feel that way. Times have changed, and so, yes, times have changed. But there's some principles in here that do not change no matter what the culture is. Right? Gets us to our third point. Timely. What does God want me to apply today? So in light of what it meant to them, in light of these principles that are true, no matter who's talking, what does this mean? How do I apply this today? Make sense? You with me? 
let me, let me give you a little illustration here. Um, <clears throat> actually, before we do that, that last one, what does God, how does God, yeah, what does God want me to apply today? That is a very spiritual question. We need to pray on that question. We need to say, God, I want to know from you, how do I apply this today? Because I am so gifted at, I am extremely gifted at justifying myself. In fact, I think each of you are extremely gifted at justifying yourself. And so when I come to this book, I want to kind of see what is going to justify how I want to do things, right? But once again, I need this book to read me. And so I could just say, well, I think God wants me to do this, but I need to ask him. We ask him, we listen to the Holy Spirit. Number two, after going through this, you might check in with community. Dan, I've been, I've been praying over this. I've got to make this new job change. I'm not making a job change. I'm giving you an example. Um, here's what I think God is calling me to do. It's based upon this and this. What do you think? And, and Dan and I have had this conversation over jogging or over coffee or whatever else. That's where community comes in and we check with other people. That's why it's also really helpful to read a, a Bible that has study notes because people who are really smart and have studied this may also have notes to contribute to the conversation. I've met a lot of people who think they got the Bible all figured out um, and they don't need study notes, but what they come up with is something way different than has been the understanding of the Bible for 2,000 plus years. I got to tell you, if you're the only one that thinks that, I don't think God changed his mind. It may be good to look at what other people are saying. But I'm saying start with him first. Talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. That's a good one. Write that one down. Talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. All right? Let me give you one more illustration of what I was talking about. If you could picture this hourglass thing. This was shown to me as a 23-year-old. Ed Laramore showed this to me back in the FAC days. He said, well, you can make all kinds of observations. There's many observations to make about the people, the, the when, all that stuff. But there's only one interpretation. What it means is limited. And so there's not a Virgin Mary in your life. And who's the Virgin Mary in my life? No, no. There's one interpretation. That's what I want to kind of get after. But there's many applications as the living Holy Spirit leads us to many applications. Are you with me? This is the more technical side of where we're going. Questions on that? See me at the class if you have any more. All right. So here's what I want to do, guys. I want to practice this together. All right. Yeah, it was great. Eric taught us some principles. Went kind of quick, and I realized some of this is quick, so there's notes on the app. There's notes you could be taking. But I want to practice studying the Scripture using these principles. So what this will look like is I want to separate our, our room here into three groups. Let's go to the next um, slide, if you would. So, somewhat arbitrarily here, you guys here will be group one, you guys here will be group two, up to Kathy and Eric, and then Rick down, you guys, probably our largest group, I might have done that wrong, but you're group three, okay? Group one, group two, group three. What I want you to do is, group one's going to look at Romans 12, group two is going to look at Matthew 25, and group three is going to look at Luke. And here's how we're going to do this. You can do this by yourself. That's okay. Some of you hate group work. I get it. <laughs> you could also do this in groups of two or three. Okay, with another person next to you. It's your choice. I'm not going to mandate it. And start looking at that passage together. Um, as you do, hit the next couple slides there. Do what we just talked about. Make observations. What does it say? The who, the what, the when, the, what, the, when, the where. Uh, what does it likely mean regardless of culture? Okay, that's the timeless principle. And number three, in light of what it says and what it means, what does God likely want us to apply today? So it is 1052. Take eight minutes. Criminally a short amount of time, but we're just kind of skimming the surface to give you a little practice. Take a look at that passage and start asking those questions in light of that. All right? Go ahead. Take, take some time until 11 o'clock. And then we're going to share. I, didn't, I don't know if I said that. We're going to share what you saw.
folks at home, um, imagine you're picking up and you can pick whatever one you want, but I'll say Matthew 25 if you want me to give you one, all right? Got a few minutes, how are we making out? Everybody good? Got a few minutes, I'm gonna ask you about it.
Okay, if you would just take one more minute, just one more minute and finish up. doing right how you All right, if you would, just take a couple more seconds, and I want to hear about that. All right, let's do the, uh, the technical side of it first here as we're wrapping up. Um, and we'll start with group number one. You guys have Romans 12, 9 to 21. Help me out here. Any, anybody from the group, uh, tell us nice and loud, and I'll repeat it. Uh, what, what, what genre? of uh, literature is Romans. An epistle. Yep. Mm -hmm. Not not Episcopal. Epistle or a letter. Epistle. Yep. Um, So, do we know who wrote it? Paul. And who did he write it to? That's the, there's a key there. Little trick in there. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. What else did you guys observe about what does it say? The who, what, when, where. It's discussing how who should live. Christians. How do Christians live in light of the rest of society? Because, like, back, now it's way different. But back then, it was hard to be a Christian. Not everybody was a Christian, and they were saying different things. I say this in jest. 2,000 years of being a Christian church, there's always been this minority thing. Going, we're following Jesus and the rest of the stuff. How do you live in a culture where most people don't follow Jesus? That's good. Yeah, what else stood out to you on that? Uh Uh-huh, Jay. Yeah, don't be proud. Yeah, be humble. It's like... Duh, that's easy, right? That's 101. Yeah, I need to preach that to myself every single day. <laughs> I was preaching it to myself on the way to church here, no joke. Like, Eric, stop being so prideful, right? We need to preach this gospel to ourselves and to each other somewhat regularly. Man, I think, I think the church, capital C, and that includes us, could go a long way to embrace humility. Humility is so huge. I'm not saying weakness. I talked about meekness last week. Meekness is having incredible strength, but under control. Right? Jesus was meek. He could have called down angels like that, but he was under control. I think God is calling us to not be doormats, but to be humble. It's good. Now I'm really preaching. <laughs> Any other thoughts there? Uh huh. Different translations. Uh huh. That's so good, Jeff. Yeah, disarming your enemies, and who doesn't want an enemy who's not disarmed? You go higher. You show that love. It's so good. And by the way. You taught something there that I didn't even mention. And that is, you know, if you're stuck on something, check other translations. How might other translations say it? Let's compare it to the King James, the New Living. Love that. So good. Dan. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. It's a, that is a very interesting verse to me, and I've been studying this for a long while, and uh, I still feel like I'm learning. I still feel like I'm learning. Uh, another thing you could do there is look at other times. Well, you, you use the Bible to understand the Bible. And so in the Psalms, uh, in first, Second Samuel 22, it talks about this idea of, burning hot, of heaping burning coals, too. So you, you could do, like, even Bible Gateway is a website. You could type in burning coals and look at what other, trans, what other verses in Scripture talk about that. That's a good tool. Jr. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes that repay will happen on this planet, but sometimes it might not. We know for a fact it will happen in the long haul. Yeah, yeah. There's a patience. There's an impatient enduring and a humility that's key. So speaking of that, any other uh, things that come to your guys' mind, and we're going to do Matthew 25 next, um, what does God like you to apply today? Anybody want to share about that? We've kind of touched on it a little bit. Go ahead, Brian. We need to outdo others in love. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that in there for sure. Dan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Override that in the spirit, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's so good, it's so good. Yeah, listen, how does it apply today? The, uh, I've been on this planet going on 42 years now, um, and the LGBTQIA plus uh, community has always been there, but it seems like the conversation is getting more and more prevalent right now. And uh, we'll get this question a lot, like, aren't we just talking about love? Why can't people just love who they want to love? Can't we just love, love, love? And that's a... We're not going to unpack that whole thing today, right? Uh, But a lot of times what they're seeing in Christians, a lot of times what they're seeing in Christians is not what they would say is love. And I think a lot of times they're right. Not all the time. But what does it look like to love deeper, to honor more, to go and show these kinds of self-sacrificial, humble love? It's good. All right. Way to end on the LGBTQIA thing. That's a nice, easy one. Uh, that's, that was on me. All right, next one over here, uh, Matthew 25. So what stood out to you? Ma- uh, Matthew 25, what kind of genre is that? I'm sorry? The gospel, yeah. And so it's one of the four gospels, and a gospel is uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's account of Jesus' life. Within the gospel of Matthew is this passage, and so let's go a little deeper. What kind of genre is that? What kind of literature? Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's good. There's a teaching component to it, and there's a prophecy part to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, What's going on here? Help us understand the who, the what, the when, the why. Jesus is t- doing this teaching, talking about prophecy. Mm-hmm. Who's he talking to? Primarily Jewish. Primarily Jewish. Yep, absolutely. And that's, Ma- that's Matthew's audience. Yep. Mm-hmm. What were you going to say in the back? Okay, okay. Uh, so here's a nice easy one. Um, what, does it, what does it mean? All right, what does Matthew 25 mean? This is the sheep and the goats passage. Okay, we'll put the sheep on the one side and the goats on the other side. Um, what does it mean regardless of culture? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot about love there. And there's, there's this phrase that keeps coming up in there, to love whom? Uh, we love God, love man, but there's a phrase in there that starts with an L. Least of these, yes. The least of these. Anybody here when you were reading that, like, what does he mean by least of these? Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So good, so good. Throughout Scripture, the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see people saying to God, hey, God, we're doing this festival, we're doing this fast, we're tithing, whatever else, and you, so often you see God saying, yeah, you're doing all this outward stuff, but you're not really loving me and loving people. I don't care about your festivals and your songs and whatever else. They're noise to my ears if you're not loving people, right? Paul writes about that in one of his epistles and says, if I have not love, I'm like a clanging gong or resounding cymbal. I think the, the point is clear, but if, if you need to, I'll have JR come up and we'll just have him crash on that cymbal for a while. And you'll be like, shut up. Right? That's what it looks like to God when we're not really loving the least of these. Least of these are Jesus' brothers who have the most need. Here at Crossroads, the leaders and I have been praying and asking God, who are the least of these in our culture, in our 08088 zip code, in this area? The people who have the most need. Well, I think it starts with people who don't have healthy families. I think God is calling us to share healthy family, whether it's biological or spiritual. I think we have a lot of people, that, and there was a rise in um, heroin usage in this heroin epidemic before the pandemic, right? So there's uh, an addiction ministry that we have that I think is so key. It's only gone up, right, since COVID. And number three, I would say food insecure. Food insecure people. When we found out in 2019 that there was 13 families at the local school who were food insecure, the leaders met, we said, not anymore. We could do that. And then the pandemic hit, and things went kind of crazy, but we've been doing this food pantry ministry, and I'm telling you, ask Kathy, the need increases each week. Inflation goes up, need goes up. What does it look like to genuinely care? We could do church, or we could be the church. Right? We could do church, churchianity, or we could be the church, Jesus followers. Any other applications? You see number three. Before we go over here, yeah. Yeah. So good. The way that they, there was a, a direct connection to the way that they were interacting with Jesus himself, walking in faith. Yes. I think in this context, it is talking about um, followers of Jesus who have the most need. But your point about neighbors who don't know him is absolutely still true. We could point to other passages for that for sure. And I'll point to football. You're trying to watch a football game and somebody sits down next to you who knows nothing about football. And they say, what's happening? What are they doing? Why do they do that? And you're just like, shut up. We're watching football, right? But we could do that same thing with people who are like, they don't have a relationship with Jesus or an understanding of the Bible. And we're like, shut up. You should know better. And for being honest... So how do we love the people who don't know Jesus? We know that God has revealed himself throughout nature. And we point them to, from general revelation to special revelation. What does the word say about who God is? It's good. All right, third one. We're going to pick up the time the pace a little bit here. Sorry, Luke chapter 14, folks, but I'm just going to give you the, the shortest one here. So what kind of genre is Luke 14? 
from in the Gospels, absolutely. More specifically, it's a parable. Yeah, it's, and it's an interesting parable. It's a little bit different than some of the other parables. There's actually two different passages in there. Um, but it's a teaching, and Jesus is trying to make a point. He's been invited to a, to a dinner, and there's people kind of looking at who else is at the dinner, and they're asking questions, and they're making statements. So um, I'm kind of helping you answer some of these questions. But again, we're at a dinner. We got who's at the dinner? Pharisees and leaders of the Pharisees, absolutely. And there's poor people now, not far away, absolutely. All right. Um, so what, what's happening? What, what's the point here? What is this passage about, Luke 14? Eating, right? Mm-hmm. So good, Phil. Once again, there's a sacrificial hum- humility, or humble, thank you, humble love that I think Jesus expects of who his followers are. Are you seeing a the theme in all three of these passages? What is a real Christian? Somebody who's loving God and loving people. Not just outwardly, but inwardly. Especially when they can't pay you back. If we're honest, we will often walk into a room and say, who do I want to talk to? Kind of sizing up, and, and man, there's Denise. Who do I not want to talk to? How do I make a beeline over here? <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. 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 So good. So good. Yeah, go ahead, Amber. Yeah. So good. Hey, so good. Yeah. May, the, may we always remember that when it comes to church or worship, but especially when studying the scriptures. It, it, ha, it speaks to us about us, but that's not, we're not the main character. He's the main character. And it's often so much revealing about who he is. So secondly, who we are in light of who he is. That's so good. Any other thoughts here from group three? Application. Though. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yes. It's a repeated thing throughout the 66 books of Scripture. I think because we people need to be reminded it's not about you. So good. All right. Yes. He set that example. Absolutely. And again, like Amber was saying, if anybody had a reason to sit back and be served, it would be the creator of everything, right, and sustainer of everything. But he sets that example for us. He shows us. So good. So uh, in the interest of time, um, let me ask you, how, how was that experience for you? Good. All right. How about another word besides good? <laughs> Enjoyable, enlightening. Okay. A little different. You know, you, you know, often you come out on a Sunday morning, you're like, you're the professional Christian, right? You teach us, we'll listen. But we're asking you to participate, right? Um, uh-huh. Bonding, yeah. Man, I, I want to be part of a church where we're not just sitting in lines and staring at the back of people's heads, as beautiful as the back of a bald head might be. Um, 
But I got to meet Paul and John, and I can't wait to see them next week. Or maybe over lunch after church. Yeah. Life together. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book, Life Together. If you know that name, he was ministering during Nazi Germany. He has a lot to say about doing life together as a church. Um, I think we take it for granted, even in our hard times, uh, that we can meet together and we can live together. Let's take advantage of that. Let me offer you a couple of observations that I made about these three passages on the next slide. Um, we, we did the sharing. Let's go to the next one. Probably two slides in, Brian. Yeah. Romans 12. That true Christ followers, people who are really following Jesus, are the ones who are caring for others, not just going through the church unity motions. That the sheep or the true followers actually care for the least of these. And by doing so, are they caring for their Savior? Luke 14, followers have humble, sacrificial love. Man, we are representatives, ambassadors of the king. We are salt and light. You are princes and princesses as daughters and sons of the king. You're a friend of God. And yet, if we're following his example, we go low. We, we go meek. We've got power at our fingertips. And yet we go meek. We go humble, self-sacrificing. That's the way of Jesus. It doesn't make it any less strong. In fact, I would argue that hmm, it takes a lot more strength to do that than to blow up at people. It's easy to blow up at people. Anyway, I think these passages, and maybe Matthew 25, are meant to be very sobering to us. Because I think there's a certain surprise component to that passage of, you know, I think I'm doing the religious thing, but am I loving Christ? Am I letting his love flow through me as I love for other people? And I think there's going to be a lot of people who come to the end of their lives and think that they're okay with God because of X and Y and Z. And Jesus is saying, true followers of me look like this. They have my love overflowing. Overflowing out of them to the church. Overflowing out of them to other people outside. Especially those who might not know him. And that's the difference between churchianity, folks, and being followers of Jesus. We need principles to know how to study Scripture and do it the right way. We need to practice this together, yes. Um, but I think we need to share the gospel in deed and word, not just for the lost people, but also for our own sake as Jesus' followers. And if you don't have a passion to share the good news with lost people, to put it mildly, I think it's worth having some conversations between you and God. Why don't I have a passion to reach lost people? Why don't I have a passion to put the gospel in action and word? And you might find that maybe you never had that conversion experience. Maybe you've been doing church, but actually haven't had Jesus make you born again. And I don't say that to put guilt on you, but to say, hey, I've learned the most dangerous thing I could do is continue to have people under my care think that they're okay with God when they're not. Followers of Jesus have his love in us and overflowing. Yes, there's hills and valleys. We're not talking about what we do and don't do, but we are talking about following Jesus and actually having Christ in me, the hope of glory, live out from me. So I want to encourage you with this, and then I'm going to come back to this passage here. We've got a lot of small groups here at the church where we can express this love for God, this love for each other, this love for lost people. And uh, it looks like this. It's this triangle. You hear Lauren say it every week. Up, in, and out. We're a family of disciples on mission. Next slide. We've got small groups. You can see where they meet. You can see the leaders there. This is a great place to learn together, to share the gospel with one another to remind one another, hey, let's be walking in humility. We hope to have more small groups in the fall, but I'm saying right there, you have seven places where you can sit down face-to-face -face with other people and live this thing out together. And as I invite the worship team up, I want to just kind of close in some prayer. And let's ask this question. Lord, are we, are we growing in knowing you? Are we growing in loving you and loving others? Would you bow your heads with me?
Father God, I ask that you would continue to give us the grace of seeing the least of these and sharing your love with them. Father, I pray for folks who uh, may be uh, a follower of you, but man, it's been a, it's been a desert season. It's been a, a bit of an Egypt wilderness kind of season. Lord, I pray for a fresh passion today, for a fresh understanding of who you are, maybe a touch to know your love. Lord, I, I pray if there's folks here today who, who aren't assured of their salvation, they're not certain that they have a relationship with you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. To embrace God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, follows him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. If that's you today, I'd love to talk with you after the service or to talk with one of our elders. But Father, may we be people who overflow the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for leaning in, by the way, on this whole series, doing this interactive thing. I'm learning from you. I think we're learning from each other. I appreciate that. Um, next week, once again, we're going to have a, a breakfast together. When you come here, we'll have breakfast is on us. We'll just, we won't have a regular worship time. We'll have people doing some teaching and some sharing. But we're going to embrace this idea of, of family and breaking bread. And we're going to practice what we preach. I talk about food all the time, right? We get to eat it together. So worship team, would you uh, lead us out, please? Let's stand together, sing one more song this morning.